the scary stories will start in 30 seconds. Before they do, I just want to remind you to subscribe if you enjoy my videos. I am incredibly meticulous with my editing to ensure there are no mistakes in any of my narrations, and that the rain sounds are perfectly balanced with my voice. So again, if you enjoy this video, please subscribe and hit the thumbs up. It helps me more than you know. Now, let's begin. I am pretty sure my best friend or my parents murdered someone when I was 15. My best friend's name is John. We have been inseparable since we were 8 years old. And when we were 15, I became good friends with another guy. His name was Byron. So here's what happened. Maybe someone else can make sense of this. It was a typical Friday night, for the most part. John was sleeping over at my house like he always did. But the thing that was different this night was that I also invited my new friend Byron over to spend the night. John hadn't met Byron yet, and to be honest, when they did meet, I could tell John didn't really like him. We were playing video games until like 2 in the morning. I fell asleep first. Now this is very important, and here's why. When I woke up in the morning, John was asleep next to me on the floor. My bed was empty, and Byron was nowhere to be seen. My first thought was that he must have gotten picked up by his mom already. I turned on my PlayStation and played some games until John woke up. When he did, he started playing the game with me. He never asked where Byron was. After a few minutes of playing, I asked if he saw Byron leave, and John said that he didn't. He said that that night, he went to sleep right after me, and that Byron was still playing games when he did. Again, nothing too concerning. We went downstairs and my mom was making breakfast. While we were eating, we heard a woman scream outside. This was absolutely terrifying, because the woman was right in front of our house, and her scream was blood-curdling. All of our faces turned white, and we knew that the woman had just seen something horrible. My mom ran outside and told us to stay in, and not 30 seconds later she came running back inside and threw up right after she slammed the door closed. Now, this was 15 years ago, and it still chills my blood to say this. Byron was laying in the middle of the road in front of my house with a knife sticking out of his neck. I never saw this, and I'm glad I didn't, because I would be way more traumatized about it. What has been tormenting me for 15 years now is this. What the hell happened to my friend? John has always stuck to his story. He fell asleep next to me while Byron was playing video games. My mom's reaction pretty much proved that she wasn't involved, and my dad passed his lie detector test. And so did my mom and John, in case you were wondering. The incident changed me. It changed my whole life. I swear I would have turned out different if it hadn't have happened. And to be honest, I feel guilty. I feel like in some way it's my fault. That night, something happened. Something happened to my friend. What do I truly believe happened? The only thing that kind of makes sense to me, that John stabbed him for some reason. Why and how did he end up in the middle of the road? I have no idea. I have had drunken incidents as an adult with John, begging him to confess to me, and he has never changed his story. Not one word. I don't think I'll ever know what happened to Byron, but at least once a month for the past 15 years, I have this nightmare. I'm laying in bed, and I can't move. I'm staring at my bedroom door, and it swings open. Byron rushes in, screaming with the knife in his neck and his hands out like he's going to choke me the second that his hands hit my throat I wake up
I'm writing this as my girlfriend tells me the story, so these will be her words pretty much. When I was 12 years old, I spent the night with my best friend Carrie. We had big plans for our sleepover. We were planning to stay up all night, listen to music, play board games, and talk about boys. The usual things that girls do. Around 2 a.m., after her parents were sleeping, we decided that we were hungry. We knew that we had to be quiet so that we didn't wake them, so we tiptoed into the hallway from her room. As we made our way into the kitchen, we had to go through the dining room. Because we were so quiet, we heard a tapping noise. Immediately, we both knew that someone was tapping on the living room window. You could see into the living room from the dining room, so immediately, our heads turned towards the living room. We could see a figure standing on the porch next to the window. Because of the way the porch light was illuminating the figure, it looked like a shadow. We thought the figure was Carrie's sister's boyfriend. The sister and boyfriend had been banned from seeing each other, and we assumed this was his weird way of getting her attention. We decided that either he would leave on his own, and Tina, Carrie's sister, would see him, or Carrie's parents would wake up and run him off. We didn't want the last possibility to happen, because we had already been told to go to sleep more than once, and we knew that we would get in trouble for sneaking into the kitchen for food when we were supposed to be asleep. As we walked through the dining room, the figure kept tapping at the window. When he came into full view, we knew for sure it was a man, and we could tell that he had a knife in his hand. The knife was what he was tapping with. Now because this window had no shades, blinds, or curtains, we were sure that he could see us as well. We both dropped to the floor and started crawling to the kitchen. When we made it to the kitchen, we literally sat in the middle of the kitchen floor, whispering about what we had just seen. We were both sure that what we saw was a man with a knife. We knew that we had to get to our parents' room as quickly as possible. To do this, we had to walk through the living room. We sat in the kitchen trying to figure out how we were going to get there without him seeing us. We peeked around the kitchen wall and could still see him standing on the front porch. We couldn't make it to our parents' room without him possibly seeing us. We decided to crawl back to her room. As we did, we heard the front doorknob jiggling. We basically freaked. We crawled back to her room as fast as we could and locked the door. We crawled to her bedroom window that faced the street so that we could see if he was still on the front porch. We didn't see him. We didn't hear tapping either. As we were watching from her window, we saw him leave her yard and start walking up the street towards the main highway. I could see the knife shimmering off the streetlights. It was a huge butcher's knife. When we realized that he was leaving, we ran into her parents' room to tell them what happened. We told them what we had seen, and due to our overactive imaginations and hundreds of stories that freaked us out before, they didn't believe us. We reluctantly went back to her bedroom and locked the door. We ended up sleeping on the floor, hidden by the bed from any windows in her room. The next morning was a Sunday. Carrie's dad always walked to the corner store up the street to get a paper, coffee, and smokes. When he came back, he was empty-handed. He said the store was roped off with police tape, and it turned out the clerk in the store had been stabbed to death. This happened around four years ago. I live in a two-story home and I hear many noises sometimes. I always just think that they're house noises. I was just getting up from streaming to go to use the bathroom. While I was in there, I heard some noises from my parents' bedroom closet. Almost sounded like boxes opening, but this time, I did not think it was a house noise. I called out. Mom? but then remembered that she was outside in the front yard. So I go to check what the noise was. Now I have only been in my parents' closet once, and that was only about a month ago. My mom and dad kept their shoes and shoe boxes in there, but when I checked, I didn't find any shoes or shoe boxes. I also noticed that the light was on. 
I then heard a metallic noise, which sounded like a metal plate closing. This made me jump. I looked all around the room searching for what the noise could have been. I went over and checked my parents' bathroom, and that's when I noticed it. The drain had been lifted open and closed, and that's what the noise was. I could tell because the screws were laying on the floor next to it. I then heard the noise of someone banging on a metal object. I ran downstairs not looking back, but I could hear someone's footsteps behind me. I literally jumped down the stairs and ran outside to my parents. I then realized that they weren't home. I ran to the neighbors and asked them to call 911 because there was someone in my house. I then called my parents and told them what had happened. They showed up before three police cruisers did. One of them questioned me, and the other two searched the house. Around two hours later, they came outside of the house with three men handcuffed. All of them looked very tall and strong. They looked like drug addicts. The officer then told my parents where they were hiding, but they didn't tell me. I only found out a week later that the men had been living in our vents and sleeping in the walls of my bedroom. I am diagnosed with autism, ADHD, and depression. I am a total introvert. I hate people. They always screw me over. Like a kid from first grade who pretty much brainwashed me into thinking that everyone hated me and that he was my only friend. Anyway, I digress. I have always seen and heard things that were not there. Example, hearing my name being called when I was home alone. This happened all the time. I always kept it to myself. I did, however, tell my best friend, the IT woman at my high school. We hit it off and in no way was any of this sexual. She was so funny and seemed to be a 15-year-old inside a 24-year-old's body. We got along like a house on fire. I also had one other friend. Her name was Annabelle. She and I were in a relationship. I would never see Annabelle in the hallways or in any of my classes. I found it odd, but I didn't care. I was too obsessed with the fact that somebody my age wanted to spend time with me on a regular basis. It was amazing. Whenever I was eating lunch and looked over, she was always there beside me. We talked about everything under the sun. I never met her family or saw any pictures. She did not have a phone either, which I found hard to believe at first as we were freshmen in high school. A creepy thing started to happen around halfway through the school year. I would start seeing her walk into a bathroom and then never walk out. And I asked somebody to see if she was still in there and they would say that it was empty. The bathroom, that is. I found it odd but brushed it off. Whenever I would talk to her in front of other people, they would always give me weird looks, which I thought was rude. Is it so unbelievable that I have a girlfriend? I'll try to introduce her to some people and they would call me a psycho. I never knew why. That is until I asked my friend, the IT woman, whether she had access to the school's cameras or not. But I wanted to see how Annabelle was hiding in the bathrooms and suddenly popping beside me when I was eating lunch when she had not been there a second before. My friend said that she did and pulled up some surveillance footage and what I saw scarred me for life. We found a particular file in which we were talking on a bench. Afterwards, she went into the bathroom and didn't come out. I wanted to see where she went after she got out of the bathroom, because she would do this often. But to my horror, the footage revealed that I was talking to a blank space of air. I stared. I was frozen. I asked her to find some different files of the video in which Annabelle and I were talking. Yet again, there was no Annabelle. I was yet again talking to nothing. I asked her if I could copy some files to a zip drive so that I could watch them at my house. She was hesitant at first. She saw how much this shook me up and then agreed. She let me copy down months worth of footage 
made me promise to never tell anybody about it. This is why I'm not saying her name, because she could get in real trouble. I went home and plugged it into my laptop and watched back all the footage in which we were supposedly talking. There was never anyone near me. Ever. I thought I was crazy. I had been talking to this girl for half a year, and now I realize that she never existed? It was heartbreaking, needless to say. I cried myself to sleep that night. When I woke up the next morning, I saw her sitting on my bed. She was smiling at me. She told me that she knew that I would have eventually figured it out. I asked her what it was that I figured out. She told me that she wasn't real. Never was real. All the interactions she had with me were fake. And then the most horrifying thing happened next. She began to twitch, spasming all over the place on my floor, making tons of noise. Looking back, I don't know how she made any noise, seeing as she wasn't real. Her head started to switch back and forth between her head and the head of something horrifically terrifying. Her head calmed down, and when she looked at me, it was as if the devil itself was staring me down. It still was her head, but it was just so evil. I don't know how to explain it. I was frozen in fear. I willed for it to stop, and surprisingly, it did. I wanted her to go away, and she did. This freaked me out even more. Just as I thought about what if she came back, she was back immediately. She let out the most blood-curdling scream, and then told me something that would shake me to my core even today. She said, and I quote, Did you really think I was real? I'm all in your head. You made me up. I am a fragment of your imagination, but I have become self-aware, no longer your sweet girlfriend. I will control you for the rest of your life. You will do as I say when and where I say it. You have no power over me. Now stand up. I felt my leg muscles starting to contract. I was sitting on my bed at the moment, and wanted so badly not to stand up, to show her I was stronger. Any such struggle to keep my legs from contracting all the way into standing position. I could see her struggling physically. And then it hit me. She was a fragment of my imagination. The other way around. I willed for her to sit down. And to my surprise, she did. I told her she didn't have any power over me. And that I was real. And she wasn't. She started to apologize and I screamed at her. I must have thought something as I did this, but as I screamed, her skin peeled away, as if the wind exiting my mouth was stripping her to the bare bone. Before long, she was nothing but a skinless humanoid figure. She smiled at me, with her disgusting skinless mouth, and told me this, Well played, but this is not over and then she melted into the floor, and all was normal again. I was so shaken up by this that I went to the bathroom and vomited all night long. Part of me thought that this would get her out of me. I was so wrong. She would harass me for the next two and a half years of my life, no longer in her girl form, but in her skinless bloody form. She would appear from nowhere and jump scare me, that was mostly the extent of her abuse. But this happened 24-7. In class. In the hallways. Everywhere. But then one day, she stopped. I don't know why, but I'm glad she did. This event occurred when I was 11, on Halloween night. At the time I was still a stick-thin girl with nothing to actually distinguish I was a girl, especially since earlier that year, I decided I didn't want to be confused with my twin sister anymore, so I had gotten a pixie cut and began dressing in black. At the time I had no girlfriends, but up the road a half a mile was my friend Austin, 
and another mile and a half, Quinn. I had become close to them and would often go exploring and fishing with them, so it was only natural that we had decided that the three of us were going to go trick-or-treating together. Compared to Austin and my neighborhood, Quinn's was the wealthier one. So in hopes of getting the best candy, we had decided we would go to Quinn's. I had been to Quinn's house a few times, but most of the time, when we hung out, we would walk another mile up from Quinn's to the Rudders for Slurpees, and then another two miles down from my house to the park and lake. So Austin and I weren't familiar with this neighborhood or the ones around it. But I digress. My mother had a new boyfriend at the time, so she didn't really care what I was doing. It was Pennsylvania, so it was super cold. So any costume I had on was pretty much covered up with a jacket and leggings. I had been a dark fairy, so you could still guess what I was just because of the black sparkly wings. I left early to walk to Austin's house. When I got there, I had to ask Austin what he was because he was in a white button-up, black dress pants, with a tie, and heavy black jacket over it. He moved his jacket to show me the cheap sheriff's badge attached to his belt and told me that he was a detective. I laughed and his parents shooed us away. I remember his dad grumbling what was a boy doing with sparkly wings when I realized he had been talking about me which definitely dampened my spirits. Austin's dad was drinking, though, so I didn't correct him. Austin attempted to cheer me up the entire way to Quinn's house, and soon all was forgotten. Quinn's house was the biggest house I had ever seen at the time, in a nice neighborhood, with houses on each side that looked just like his. Quinn's mother welcomed us warmly and gave us treats to start off our trick-or-treating, Quinn had the best costume of us, a realistic looking Grim Reaper robe with a black screen over the face with red glowing eyes and a plastic bloody sheath. Quinn's neighborhood was swamped with kids from my school and soon we had gone through almost the entire neighborhood with our bags really weighing us down. It was getting late, but Quinn wanted to continue on and Austin and I were in no rush to go home, so we agreed despite how dark it was getting. Quinn told us that there was a shortcut to the other neighborhood throughout his backyard if we went down the hill and through the trees for a while. Now that kind of freaked me out, but being the only girl, I wasn't about to let on that I was scared, so I gulped when this was suggested, but nodded my approval, and off we went. Quinn takes off his mask to better see as we stumble down Quinn's backyard and decides to leave his sheath behind. We started through the woods, and within five minutes of walking and joking, we realized that none of us had thought to bring a flashlight, but it was fall, so there were no leaves on the trees, and light from the moon helped to light the way, if only enough not to walk right into a tree. Austin asks how much longer, and I can tell by the hitch in his voice that he likes this shortcut about as much as I do. Before Quinn can answer, we hear a crunch from somewhere ahead of us, and we all freeze as Quinn sticks up his hand into the air to silence us. Did you hear that? Quinn whispered. I remain silent, but Austin snorts and replies, Stop it, Quinn, that's not going to work. You're not going to scare us. And Quinn gasps and still whispering hisses, I'm not joking. I thought I heard something, and before I can tell them both to keep walking, a shape in the darkness catches my eye. Ahead of us, maybe twenty feet. It's dark, so I can't distinguish anything, but it's only a moment later that no guessing is needed. Hey there, boys, came a strange man's reply from the spot. Quinn and Austin turn in horror as the man continues to walk towards us. Ooh. Who are you? stammers Quinn. With this, a deep laugh bellows out of the man. Me? I'm the devil. This whole time he's walking closer to us, but in the silhouette of darkness, I see no signs of this man wearing a costume. No horns or anything. Th th this is my property. What are you doing in these woods? 
Oh, me? Just out for a stroll. I don't get out nearly as often as I would like. Now, he's about ten feet from us, halfway peeking out from behind a tree. Quinn, I whisper, let's just go. But Quinn, in a moment of bravery or stupidity, it's debatable. He yells to the man, What is wrong with you? Stop talking to us, we're just trying to get through. And with that, Quinn nudges Austin and I, and we begin making a wide turn around the man, who silently watches us, and spins around the tree we walk past, with just his head and a hand sticking out to watch us as we walk past. Austin whispered to me, It's Halloween. He's just trying to scare us. I don't respond, just keeping my eyes locked on the man. He then yells, I hope I haven't scared you, boys. I just really like your costumes. Come closer and let me have a better look. Immediately, the comment sent up red flags to me, because you couldn't tell what Austin was, especially at a distance, and with Quinn's hood and sheath gone, you couldn't tell what he was either. That left me, and I didn't like that. You, boy, with the wings, come here, let me help you fly. And with that, he laughed again. Now I had been getting bullied for how short my hair was, and Quinn and Austin knew how much it hurt me every time I was mistaken for a boy, so they had taken to sticking up for me, and unfortunately, tonight was no exception. Stop talking to her, you creep, Austin yelled and with that he picked up a rock and threw it at the man. It bounced off the tree where the man was half covering, and the man suddenly did a creepy little half jump, half dance, and clapped his hands. Her? You're a little girl? That's even better. And with that, much like a wild animal, bounded forward, hands first on all fours, I immediately dropped my candy and all three of us began screaming our heads off and running. I don't think he chased us long, but with the crunching under our feet and our screams, it was impossible to tell. I quickly had to abandon my wings too, as they continued to get stuck on branches as we weaved through the trees in pure terror. We didn't stop until we made it through the trees and onto a well-lit street. Though there were very few kids out at this point anyway. We were now over 15 minutes away from Quinn's house, and probably an hour plus walk back to my house, and it was only getting later. Quinn had dropped his bag too, only Austin had kept his, clutching it like it were a child. We took the long lit back way to Quinn's house, in almost complete silence, terrified the man would appear again, but he didn't. When we actually made it, we frantically explained what happened, and though sympathetic, Quinn's mom said that we couldn't call the police. She said that nothing had happened. We had no description of the man, and that it was Halloween. The man was probably long gone, and also was almost definitely just trying to scare us. She drove Austin and I home, and I got grounded for being so late, and for leaving my costume behind. I didn't even bother to explain what had happened and she didn't seem to notice that I had no candy. The next day, though I couldn't go out because I was grounded, Quinn came over with his mom and gave me a bag of candy that they had bought because they knew that I had lost all of mine in the woods. We never talked about it again after that, all convincing ourselves that it was probably just some creepy Halloween prank that went too far. But who knows? For some context, I was about 10 years old. I was living with my mom and my older brother, he was 12 at the time, in a small bungalow. Nothing paranormal ever happened in this house, except for maybe this one occasion. I had one of those loft beds, sort of like a bunk bed, but without a bed at the bottom. Instead there would be a desk or a couch underneath. I also had one of those doorway bead curtains hanging on my bedroom door frame, so whenever someone walked in or out of my room, 
you would distinctly hear the beads moving around. This will be relevant. My mom's room was right next to mine, but her door was perpendicular to mine, so I could see her entire door directly from my bed. My brother's room was in the basement at the time. Now, my mom only ever closes her door when she's inside her bedroom, sleeping. If she gets up during the night to go to the bathroom, her door stays open until she gets back to go back to sleep. This will also be relevant later. One night, I fell asleep and woke up at around 3 o'clock in the morning. I remember being annoyed that I woke up because I often had a hard time going back to sleep once I did wake up. I still had my earbuds in from when I was listening to music while falling asleep. I took them out, rolled them up neatly and placed them on my little wall mounted shelf behind my bed. The house was dead quiet, except for the low hum of the refrigerator, a few rooms away. I was tossing and turning for a few minutes, when I heard a loud bang coming from either our kitchen or our living room. The first thing that popped into my mind was that it sounded like a large, heavy cardboard box that had fallen onto the floor from a higher point, maybe from the kitchen counter or a table. I was extremely awake now, and very alert. I sat up slightly, listening intently for another sound, hopefully sounds of walking from my mom or my brother. Maybe my mom was in the kitchen getting some water and dropped something? but her bedroom door was closed, meaning she was in her bedroom, most likely asleep. Maybe it was my brother, but after a moment, I didn't hear any other sounds, not even walking. I lay back down facing away from my door and attempt to go back to sleep. Not even a minute later I hear my door beads move abruptly, as if someone smacked them quickly. I jolt up and quickly look toward my bedroom door. There was nothing. My beads were motionless. I decide that I must be losing my mind, and I'm just hearing things due to my adrenaline. So once again I attempt to go back to sleep, this time facing my door out of paranoia. About two minutes later I hear someone full on running in my basement. We were doing renovations in the basement at the time so our basement floors were plywood subflooring, which were quite loud if you walked, let alone ran, on them. My eyes shot wide open when I heard this. I sat up again, quietly, and listened closely for any other sounds. Then, I hear someone running in the basement for a second time. All I could think of was, why in the world would my brother be running around in the basement at three in the morning? My brother has Asperger's and therefore behaves in a very specific and repetitive manner, and he never runs around anywhere, let alone at 3 o'clock in the morning. I try to stay calm and try not to think of the worst, a break-in. I listen intensely for several minutes. Because of the small size of our house and the plywood subflooring, I could hear if someone was walking in the basement, but I heard nothing else. I wanted to call for my mom or run to her room, but I didn't dare move or make any sound. If it was an intruder, they most likely just wanted to steal some stuff, and I didn't want to give them any reason to come upstairs and potentially hurt my mom. She was a single mother with two young kids with no means of protection. Self-defense weapons are illegal in my country. I laid back down. It took me several hours to finally fall back asleep. When I woke up in the morning, my mom's door was open, and I heard her and my brother talking in the kitchen, along with cartoons playing in the living room. I got up quickly and went straight to the kitchen to ask them if they heard anything strange last night. Both of them said that they didn't. I asked if either of them found anything on the kitchen or living room floor that might have fallen in the night. They both said no. I then asked if either of them got up during the night for any reason. Again, looking at me a little strangely, they said no. I asked my brother, So you weren't running around in the basement last night? He looked at me in confusion and answered no. Neither my mom nor my brother have ever sleepwalked in their lives. My brother wasn't interested, and he went downstairs to play his computer, as usual. 
My mom was slightly concerned, so I told her what I heard the night before. We checked the front door, which was locked, and then we checked all the windows, which were all closed, locked, and undamaged. I still have no idea what happened that night. No one in my family ever plays pranks, and I can't think of any reason why they would lose a good night's sleep just to scare me. Besides, I have no idea how they would have pulled it off, seeing as how I didn't hear any sounds of walking or anyone returning to their bedroom at any point. And how would they have made the sound of my beads moving without ever actually moving them? This happened in 2011. My husband is in the armed forces, and four months after we got married, we got orders to Colorado Springs. We moved three days after Christmas Day. To give some background, I have a son from a previous relationship that had just turned four years old. We bought a huge house in a cute little suburb right outside of the springs and bordering on the Black Forest. You may have heard of it when it caught fire in 2013. It was horrifying to be evacuated, but that's another story. We had really only had time to get our stuff unloaded into the house from the moving trucks when we had to go to California for a short deployment. It was going to be three months without him, and he had to be there 11 days after we arrived in Colorado. Besides feeling a little bitter about being dumped off in the freezing Colorado in the middle of winter with my little boy and left to find our own way, we loved how beautiful the area was. The house didn't give me any weird vibes at all. It was lovely, and only about 10 years old when we moved in, which is still pretty updated by house standards. The house had been on the market for a year, and nearly sold six times before we bought it. Each time something fell through with the financing, or so my realtor said. And as a result, the owners were letting it go at a steal having moved to Kansas and paying two mortgages at that point. We were overjoyed. I would try to describe the layout of a few spots to make the story easier to understand. It had a huge open floor plan. The living room had 20 plus foot ceilings, which opened up to the loft upstairs. Our bedroom, my son's, and an extra room that would later be my daughter's were all upstairs. At the top of the stairs, there was a loft that separated the two bedrooms and then just across a long catway, my master bedroom. This was just a hallway that was open to the living room downstairs on one side and the entryway and the front door on the other side of it. Also, another important thing to note is that the main living room along with the guest room on the main floor had the ceiling light fan combo that was controlled with a remote. I can't remember exactly when it first happened, but it was in the evening, which in the Colorado winter meant it was already pitch black outside. I was on the couch watching TV while my son played in his bedroom. Out of nowhere he comes running down the stairs screaming and crying. I could hear the fear in his voice and ran to meet him on the stairs. Once he could calm himself enough to speak, he finally stutters. The darkness. I had no idea what this meant, but assumed he got scared of his closet or something, as all the other lights were on upstairs. His bedroom had a walk-in closet with a window that faced the street out front, so it still wasn't ever that dark. Our house was on a corner, so there was a light pole right at the edge of our property. I walked him back upstairs to show him it was nothing, and to put his mind at ease. I asked where, and as I suspected, he pointed at the closet. The only weird thing was that the light was already on in there. I said, See buddy, the light's on, so it's not dark. He still refused to be alone in his room for a few days and had to sleep with me. I didn't mind and figured he would get over it soon enough and it was probably just growing pains from moving to a new state and a new and much larger house than he had been used to. He did finally get over it and go back to sleeping in his own bed but I slept with my bedroom door open so I could better hear him if he got scared at night. So a while later, 
I don't remember how long exactly, I woke up in the middle of the night, not really knowing what had woken me. My collie was sleeping on the floor beside my bed, and I saw her head perk up at the same time I found myself awake. Ignoring it, I rolled onto my side and was going to go back to sleep when I heard something. It sounded like my son laughing. I was startled that he would be out of bed at this hour, and it was even stranger that he would be downstairs alone, in the dark, which was where it sounded like it was coming from. I tentatively got out of bed and my dog jumped up to join me. We stopped at the catwalk and faced the living room below. I didn't hear anything else, but my dog looked through the spindles on the banister and started to growl. I called my son's name but got no response. I walked over and flipped on the hall light and didn't see him downstairs at all, so I went to his room to check. And yep, he was fast asleep. My dog was still unmoved from her original spot, staring down at the living room, though the growling had stopped. So I scooped up my son and brought him back to my room, brought the dog in, and shut and locked the door. I was feeling unnerved at best and downright terrified at what the hell could have been the explanation for what I just heard. If my dog hadn't responded as she did, I would have assumed I was just tired and dreamt it. Nothing happened for a while, and I tried to forget it happened. I did tell my husband about it over the phone, and being the practical person he was, said it was probably a bird flying overhead. Sure, I guess it could have been that, but my dog's response still didn't add up with that. Still, I wanted to move past it, so I accepted it as the truth. Then the lights started acting weird. My son and I had gone to visit some family out of town and came home to find the spare bedroom light was on and the light was dimmed all the way. The light remote would allow you to dim the light by holding down the button and if you held it too long, the light would simply turn off and you could push the button again to turn it on. Also, the cradle for the remote that was by the master switch was broken so the remote stayed on the nightstand next to the guest bed. I had to walk into the bedroom and find the remote in the near dark and push it twice to make the light come back on normally. It always freaked me out, but I didn't let it show because I didn't want to scare my son. It became a normal occurrence for this to happen. And then, it started in the living room. I was watching TV one night after putting my son to bed while watching for my husband to call me to say goodnight as he did every night. I had the light on, but out of nowhere the fan turned on high. I left the remote on the wall cradle so it wouldn't get misplaced, so I got up and walked over to the switch and turned the fan off before returning to the couch. After a minute or so, it happened again, the fan running at full blast. So I got up to turn it off again, and as soon as I got close, it turned off. Annoyed, I turned back to the couch to get comfortable. Another few minutes go by, and the light just turns off. At this point, I just said nope, turned off the TV, and called it a night. When I woke up in the morning, the light was back on, and the fan was running on high. Of course, when I told my husband about all these things, he said it must be getting interference from a neighbor's remote or something of that nature. Yeah. I thought that sounded like a load of crap too, but I really wanted a logical explanation so that I didn't feel so scared being awake alone at night in my own house. My husband finally made it to our home, and naturally the lights didn't malfunction when he was around. I looked like an irrational and scared woman, letting my mind play tricks on me. But one night, we were both watching TV, and we could see a dark little head peek over this section where the lower wall meets the spindles on the banister at our catwalk. Assuming it was my son sneaking out of bed to spy some extra TV, my husband went to catch him, but came downstairs puzzled when he found my son sleeping soundly. We would always catch a glimpse of what looked like a dark-haired child peeking around or down at us from up there, and I think at this point he finally started to believe me. 
We were home alone once while my son was at school and heard a huge bang from the spare bedroom upstairs. My husband went to check it out, but never found a thing out of place. Occasionally, we would hear running or footsteps in the same room. After a year there, my daughter was born, and that became her room, which made the steps and running much scarier as she was a newborn and couldn't even walk. My in-laws came once and stayed with my kids so my husband and I could go on an overnight trip alone up to Woodland Park for our anniversary. But when we got back, my mother-in-law said that she would never stay alone in that house again. She never said what scared her so much, but she was convinced that the house was not right. I hadn't even told anyone but my husband about what had happened to me in the first few months there. I never expected to find a haunted house in the burbs and in a newer house. I still can't explain what happened with all of the weird things that went on there. We moved in 2014 when we got orders to another state, and I haven't felt creeped out or like I wasn't alone or was being watched in any of our houses since then. This story happened about seven years ago, when I was 19 years old. I was attending college in southern Utah, which was located about two and a half hours away from Las Vegas. Because we were so close, my friends and I frequently visited the city on weekends. We were fairly familiar with it by the time we hit sophomore year, and had spent many days and nights there. Mostly it was just a group of girls who went, and we had never had any trouble. On this night, it was a Thursday on Christmas break. My friend, and we'll call him B, was due to fly to Virginia on a red-eye flight from Vegas. I agreed to drive him to the airport so that he wouldn't need to pay for parking. And two of our other friends, N and A, agreed to come with us so I wouldn't have to drive back alone. In total, there were two boys and two girls, all 19, and the boys over 6 feet. We left around midnight, all of us wearing pajamas and hoodies, and looking all around like the very young, poor students we were. The first part of the night was great. Beast flight wasn't until about 4 a.m., so we had time to kill. We roamed the strip, wished we could buy alcohol and gamble, and appreciated how much warmer Vegas was compared to Utah. B and I had been to Vegas only a few weeks before, and had seen Fremont Street the original Vegas Strip, for the first time. N and A had never seen it before, so we decided to take them. A few weeks before, there had been a live concert on the street, people ziplining from the ceiling, people dancing. Tonight, there was pretty much just us. Fremont Street is well lit and lined with a lot of gentlemen's clubs. In the middle of the street, there was a huge Christmas tree, as we approached the tree, I noticed a man, white male, maybe mid-thirties to forties, long, dirty hair, dressed darkly. He had been standing with a group of men, maybe about ten of them, all hanging back quietly in the shadow between two clubs. They seemed to be minding their own business, but this guy was strange. We locked eyes and he walked straight towards me. He never once looked away. When he got close, he turned sharply and went back the way he just came from, and he did not look happy. N and A didn't even seem to notice. He made me uneasy, and when I turned to see where he had gone, he was standing maybe 30 feet behind, standing behind an advertisement. He was on the phone, and staring directly at me again. He hung up and walked away, further down the street where he had wandered in, and didn't look back. While I was watching him, B had also noticed this strange man's behavior. He had turned to look at the group of men, one of who was also on the phone. As soon as the staring man hung up, so did the group. He, the man in the group, stood suddenly and beckoned to another group of about ten men waiting opposite the Christmas tree. We had never even noticed them there. That's when B announced that we needed to go. 
Both groups were walking towards the four of us quickly, and it took a few terrifying seconds to get N and A to respond. We quickly walked back down the street, trying to be calm as possible, and at this point both groups had merged and were following us. I don't know if you've ever been followed by a literal wall of men, but I, 0 out of 10, would recommend it. We decided to turn a corner into the side street, and as soon as we did, we broke into a run. It might not be related, and probably isn't, but to add to the terror, as we tried to cross the street, a very sketchy looking taxi driver slammed his brakes into the crosswalk on a green light. He just stared at us, and we finally broke into a run around his car. He didn't even move. We made it safely to our car, and drove as quickly as we could away from Fremont Street. The strangest thing of all, though, is I'm not sure what they wanted. We weren't dressed like we had money. Plus, none of us had money. There was an older guy with his wallet literally standing outside of a club near them, and two working women not far from them either. They all seemed like easy targets. The only thing I can think of is maybe human trafficking, since I was getting a lot of the attention. Even with me telling this story, I'm not sure I've managed to capture how actually terrifying this was at the time. I had an extremely creepy experience a few years ago, and it is still the most intimidated I've ever felt in broad daylight in a public place. I had a few hours to kill before I got caught up with my boyfriend, who was working, and decided to head into the city center to do some shopping and browsing. As I head up to the doors of a larger shopping center, I immediately met eyes with a man in a dark jacket and jeans lurking outside the shops. He seemed really intense and eyed me up and down, but I didn't think anything of it. I broke eye contact with him and headed straight for the doors. As you enter the shopping center, there is an elevator to the left and a series of escalators to the right. As I have nowhere in particular to be, I head for the escalators. The escalators tend to be quite busy, but I felt slightly uneasy about how close the person behind me was, so I moved my bag from the side to the front of me to feel a bit of security. The first floor doesn't have many shops that interest me, so I walk around to the next escalator. I start to become very aware of my surroundings and can feel someone following a little too closely behind me. As I reach the second and third floor, someone is still following closely behind. I can tell it's a man, and I feel he is towering over me. I start to feel really anxious as he keeps taking the same corners and continuing up the escalators right behind me. I can feel his breath on my hair. I decide to continue up to the top floor as there is a big open space with a food court and toilets, hoping he'll stop following. I continue up the next series of escalators, and the creep follows closely behind me the whole way. The most unsettling thing about it was that he didn't say anything. He just stood very silently behind me, as if he just wanted to intimidate me. I really thought that if this kind of stuff ever happened to me, I would turn around and ask for the time, just so that I could get a good look at him and hopefully defuse the situation. But I just felt so much dread in that moment and couldn't talk myself to turning around. As I reach the top floor, I almost sigh with relief, as there are loads of people about, and I can head straight for the lady's toilet without fear of him following me. Almost running at this point, I make a beeline for the bathroom, and phone my friend for some advice. My boyfriend was working, I didn't want him to worry whilst he still had a few hours of his shift. My friend reminded me that our other friend was working and happened to work in a woman's shoe store a few floors down. I waited for a good 20-30 minutes inside the toilets, hyping myself up to go back out. I really hoped that he had given up and that would be the end of it. I walked out hesitantly and scanned the food court, hoping the coast would be clear and I could get to the escalators to make my way downstairs. This next part really gave me chills and sticks with me. As soon as I head towards the escalators, up jumps this weird guy sitting in the food court. 
This was directly across from the escalators that would take me back downstairs. I finally get a good look at him and realized it was the guy I had seen lurking at the front door. I noticed an obvious logo on the arm of his jacket and recognized it as Stone Island branded and made a mental note of his appearance. As I got closer to the escalator, he literally ran towards me like he was chasing after me. My heart sank as I realized this was very real and scary and he had waited on me. Thankfully he wasn't quite quick enough and another shopper managed to get behind me before he reached me. I was then able to make my way down the escalators as fast as I could, getting a bit of space between us. My anxiety is terrible at this point, and I feel myself starting to shake and feel sick. I head straight for my friend's work and look back to see the stalker following me along the floor. I walk into the shop, and my friend heads out from the back and sees how distressed I am, and she asks what's wrong. I sit down and her workmates crowd around me, and I tell them what's happening and describe the guy with the Stone Island jacket. Just as I look up, I see the creep over the other side of the floor, looking straight into the shop, and I nudged, that's him. My friend's manager charged out and chases him. She was under five foot, but had a lot of guts. She calls for a security guard, and I see her pointing and shouting at him. Creepy stalker got such a fright at the confrontation and made a run for it down the nearest escalator. I still feel uneasy about the whole thing and wonder how long he had been waiting outside to find someone to follow and how many times he had done it before and since. I really don't know what his aim was and why he chose me, but I'll never forget that Stone Island jacket. This happened when I was 13. I started school in September and noticed that all of my friends were in other classes while I was alone in mine. I felt really sad but I wanted to make friends in class, so I started to hang around with three girls. We'll call the first one I wanted to talk about, Kay. Kay was very special. She was very short and horribly skinny even though she told me that she was eating properly. She was speaking so low it was really hard to hear her, and she seemed to have some mental issues, like depression and anxiety. She had a lot of health issues also, but I never really got to know fully what it was. We got closer and closer during the school year, and yeah, she was really weird. Some kind of freak. But she was really kind and nice, and we had a lot in common. One night we were talking about my then boyfriend, who was a friend of hers. She was the one who introduced us to each other last year. She told me she was worried about him, and I asked her why. She answered, I did some black magic, like I usually do. And I saw that he was one of Satan's puppets. I hope I'm wrong, but I don't think so. I thought to myself, is she serious? But I didn't say anything. She then told me, You, you're special, but there's something wrong with you. You have a dark shadow on your heart. I don't even remember what I told her. At the time, I thought she was joking and didn't really mind this. One day, she asks me if I want to come to her place to play some video games. I never had the occasion before, so I said okay and we headed out. To be honest, even from the outside, this place creeped me out. I had a bad feeling, but I came anyway. She introduced me to her mother and sister. We exchanged a few words and we went to her room and started playing. The door was open, and after one hour, I saw a shadow. She told me her father was coming upstairs. He took a look in the room and I greeted him. He didn't answer, just shook his head and left. It made me feel really uncomfortable. After a three hour play, I told Kay that it was time for me to head home. She told me that she wanted to show me the house fully before I left. I followed her around until I noticed a door she didn't tell me about. I asked, what's this room? And she told me, stay away. My dad summons demons in this room. Okay, now I really wanted to go home. 
this place, this family, it was definitely scary. I went home in a hurry after she told me about the room. The day after I came, I saw her at school and noticed immediately that there was something wrong. I asked her if she was okay, and looking me dead in the eye, she told me, Do not ever come to my house again. I say it for your own safety. I was really shocked and asked her if I did anything wrong. She then told me, when my dad met you, he tried to read into you. You pushed him away like nobody else did. I mean, with your mind. You pushed him away when he tried to read you, like you had some sort of strong psychic ability. He told this to my uncle and now he wants you to be a part of us. He wants you because you have power. He would do anything to have you on our side. That's why I tell you to stay away. You seem to have some power that you don't understand or even know that you have. If my father and my uncle manage to grab you, they'll use this power against you to make you weak and use you all they want. You'll become their puppet. Please, I want you no harm, but they do. Don't come again. Next time I swear they won't let you leave that easily. I didn't know what to do or say. I was so shocked. So I just said, okay. I learned by a mutual friend later that her family was part of some obscure cult where they practiced black magic and other things. I didn't know if all of that was true or not, but I was horribly scared that something might happen if I wasn't careful. And I became paranoid because of that. I slowly pushed her away from me and avoided to go near her house. I don't know what she's up to now. I feel bad because I really liked you, but you definitely were too much of a creep for me. This happened at this past Saturday at my bachelorette party. The theme of my party was boats and hoes and took place on a lake surrounded by mansions. One of my best friends lives there. The day started off awesome. I was surrounded by a plethora of paper, chocolate, light up and inflatable penises. We spent the day on the lake hooting and hollering and making all of the other boaters laugh with our six foot blow up man poles. This is a really nice lake community, but they also like to party, so they were all in good spirits about the explicit nature of our voyage. We get back to shore happy that we made our presence known to the entire lake. The annual community party is in a few hours, so we get ready and shine up the old lads for another show. We head over to the party on the boat and try to bank the boat at the park where the party is a couple of times until we are sure it's pulled up far enough to not float away. This is relevant for later. So we roll in the life of this snooze fest and the desperate housewives and their bald, drunk husbands are all about the D. It's a good time. I'm working on an awesome guitar solo using my six foot willy when I smell someone behind me. Cigarettes and booze and B.O. and I want to vomit. The creep is in a pitted out gray t-shirt and black basketball shorts. Probably mid 40s and definitely not a member of this upper class community. So you like dick, huh? I think my friend Willie is pretty funny, yes. He's monotone, no eye contact or smiles. I start to walk away. I bet you like a lot of dick, don't you? He looks at me, he says, no. Are you gonna use that on yourself later? I walk away quickly and don't look back. I find my girlfriends and tell them to be on creep alert. Next thing I know, he approaches my sister and asks her the same questions. She tells me, we tell the gang, and we are all on high alert. Then he approaches my soon-to-be sister-in-law. So how old is the bride? My friend Jay comes over to the rescue. None of your business. I brought my friends here to have a good time and you're creeping us out. Leave us alone. He then scurries away into the shadows. Not long after we see him and his friend watching us on the dance floor. We keep an eye on him. Luckily the band is on their last song. 
It's going on 2 a.m. and we regroup around a picnic table for a while. The creep is nowhere in sight. When we're ready to call it a night, we walk back to our boat. We're confused because we can't find it until we notice that it's floating away. Someone had, minutes before, pushed the boat offshore. A couple of the girls jump in after it, and that's when we see their boat off a ways with the other lights watching us. We officially went from feeling annoyed to feeling threatened. The girls get the boat back to us, and we all get on. The dark boat starts driving away down the lake. Crap! We have to go that way to get to the lake house that we're staying at. We give them distance until we can no longer see their boat. They never turn their lights back on and head home. As we are docking in front of our lake house, we see that the boat is coming up behind us. They snuck away and hid, then followed us. Great, they know where we're staying now. Well, I'm pretty drunk at this point, so I'm feeling brave. So I stand at the end of the dock as they coast slowly by. I'm staring at them dead in the eyes. I see you. They are looking back at me the same way. Forget this. We run inside, lock all of the doors, and pray we have no other encounters with these hillbilly freaks. I know that gyrating around with a bunch of dicks isn't exactly giving off a nun vibe, but we are clearly having a good-hearted fun time with the community and not dressing slutty or being flirtatious at all. It's disgusting when I think about it, because I can still smell that guy. There always has to be someone to ruin the fun. Every year for summer holidays, my family and I go to my grandparents' house in a region in France. And they have the luck to live on a cliff right next to the beach, which is pretty neat. And for you to understand the situation I was in, I'll do a quick description of the place, and mostly important, how to access the beach. When we get out of the house, we need to cross a little road and get to an entrance between bushes. Then it's a clear but narrow path that you can take just to enjoy the view of the sea. Or you can also go to a staircase built in the rock of the cliff. Then you'll just have to walk on medium-sized stones, and ta-da, you've arrived to the beach. The place itself is pretty big, but there's only a few ways to access it. By the staircase I described, or by another one at the other end of it. Also, big thing to mention, as I grew older, I stopped building sand castles and swimming with my family. I'm 18, and the older of three other siblings way younger than me, so I was done playing with child's games, and I started to climb the cliffs for fun. Not the steep ones, it was more so a semi-hiking and partially collapsed cliff. This will be relevant later. Now on to the story. Last year, after having dinner, I headed out for a little walk on the beach. No one seemed determined to come with me, so I went alone. No big deal. I did it every evening. After going down the staircase, I walked a little bit, and then sat down on a stone to smoke a joint and listen to some music. Not really smart, but hey, I'm a teen in a little village that I go to every summer, and as much as I love my family, it gets pretty boring from time to time. Anyways, I'm enjoying my time when I spot a guy in the corner of my eye at maybe 40 meters of me. No big deal. It's a free access beach after all. But then he starts heading his way towards me. His head was shaved and he had square shaped glasses on. Maybe around his mid-twenties or early thirties. He was pretty tan, like he worked outside for a long time. The bald guy is getting closer, but again, I don't own the beach. As he's coming next to me, I hear over my music that he is trying to talk to me. I remove my headphones and he says something along the lines of, Hey, you look familiar. Have we met before? I answered with a calm but firm no. But he keeps insisting that he saw me at the beach today. And Searle said, maybe he did. But there are tons of people at the beach. I don't remember everyone I see. The way I'm responding clearly implies that I'm not interested in having a conversation with him. 
but he sits down on the stone next to me and keeps talking, mostly about himself. That he still loves the beach, the weather is nice, that I'm nice with him. That's where it got creepy. He says that it's rare to find nice girls, and that he's happy that I'm not a prude, stuck-up girl. He then asks about my name and where I live, and of course I didn't say a thing. He started to lean closer to me, which made me feel really uncomfortable always, with a huge grin on his face. And that's when it hit me. Remember when I said that there were only a few entrances to the beach? That guy was sitting right between me and the staircase. I was cornered. No one was there. We were completely alone. And even though I'm a quiet athletic, I'm 4'9 and weigh 90 pounds. This guy is twice my size, and he clearly wants to continue our discussion. As I'm not responding, he started to sound annoyed, clenching his fist, but still with his stupid grin glued to his face. He asked me if I really was a good girl, and why won't I talk to him? I'm shutting myself at this point when I look down at my left hand and almost let out a sigh of relief. One of the cliffs that I'm used to climbing onto is right next to us. And even if I said that they are more like hiking than climbing, I could rush to the top in a matter of seconds, as I'm used to doing so. Run on the narrow path and go home safe. So I just got up and said, I don't want to talk anymore. Good evening. He looked startled for a minute. Looked back at the staircase for a second, which confirmed my suspicions. He thought he had blocked me. He thought he had blocked my only way of escaping, since the other stairs were way too far. To this day, it scares me that it was his first reaction. At this point, I'm high, tired, and terrified, but I start to walk confidently to the cliff at a high pace, and in the corner of my eye, I can see that he is standing now looking in my direction. As soon as I'm close enough, I literally start to jump for a rock to another rock as fast as I can, scratching myself in the process. When I arrive at the top, I look down and he is looking at me, not smiling like before, but frowning and looking like he was on the verge of committing a crime. I then sprinted to my grandparents' house, which luckily is very close, and explained everything to my mom, and the next day I reported the guy to the police station, giving the best description that I could. Since it's a small village, they could apprehend him easily if he was a resident, but to be fair, French police suck, and nothing came of it. Growing up, I had a small circle of people I considered my best friends. Their names were Brandon, Cody, and Corey. Cody and Corey were brothers and lived closer to me than Brandon, so I would often stay at their house, and them mine, and we became essentially family. Corey was always a little much. He had anger issues, and from time to time he would get into fights at school, cursing at his mom and breaking things. He also would beat up Corey quite regularly, even though Cody was a year older than him. So while Corey was in a good mood, we had a lot of fun hanging out, playing games on the computer. It always felt like you had to walk on eggshells around him. Well, in seventh grade, my single mom met a man who lived a few hours away, and my mom, brothers, and I went to go live with him. It was hard leaving my friends behind. And though we would occasionally call each other after a while, the calls stopped, and we drifted apart. A couple years pass in my new town before my mom and the guy decide that it's not going to work out. So to my utter elation, my mom tells me we were going back home, and I'd get to go to my old school again. I soon realized, though, that a lot had changed from junior high to high school. Brandon and Cody no longer sat at the same table, as Corey. Corey now sat with the druggies and troublemakers. I learned that he had started drinking and smoking weed and experimenting with hard drugs. That he was no longer living at home after assaulting his mom and he was now staying with one of his druggy friends. Cody told me how worried he was about the path that Corey was spiraling down and that he didn't know how to help his brother straighten out. The first time I spoke to Corey after returning he asked me if I smoked pot and invited me to come chill with him after school. 
I declined and would continue declining his occasional offers until one day he stopped showing up to school, dropping out as a sophomore. It was hard seeing him like that. He had always had issues, but was always protective of me and my brothers at the same time. He'd come up from a broken home just like we did. His dad's passing when he was very young, and mine going to prison when I was young. He loved my mom, and had even gotten suspended when another kid insulted her, and he overheard it and then proceeded to headbutt him. As I entered adulthood, we had lost touch completely, save for being friends on Facebook, which he only seemed to use to post things like 420 and where the coke at, and who's trying to smash. After a while, I noticed he stopped posting altogether. One day, though, I messaged Cody, whom I'd also not really talked to in years. I asked how he was doing, how Corey was. He told me he had gotten an apartment and had a job that he liked. And he told me Corey was doing better, that he had realized he needed to straighten himself out, and he joined the Marines. I told him I was happy to hear it, and we made plans to make plans, but never really followed up on them. Sure enough, I started seeing posts with Corey in a Marine's uniform on my Facebook. I saw that he had met a girl and had a baby on the way. And in his pictures, he looked genuinely happy. We would occasionally comment lighthearted things on each other's posts. And while we hadn't hung out in years, I was glad to know that he was doing well. Time kept moving as it tends to do. I myself had gotten married and moved a few towns away for work. Lying in bed one night, I saw a post from Corey that made my heart sink. Paraphrasing, it said something like, Sucks when you catch your girl cheating on you with a friend. I don't know why, but something made me reach out. I told him I was sorry and that if he ever needed anything or a place to sleep for the night, he could reach out to me. I meant what I said, but I'd never expected that he would take me up on the offer. But a few minutes later, a message popped up in my DMs from Corey. Well, actually, Nick, I'm homeless right now. I would appreciate it if I could stay with you for a few nights. I told him sure. I mean, he was going through a tough time. The mother of his child just cheated on him. Besides, he had gotten his life together, and it might be nice to catch up. He told me he would need a ride, that he didn't have a car currently, and I told him I'd figure it out. The best I could guess is he didn't really have a home or a car, because he was letting his girlfriend keep them. But I didn't pry. We decided that he would come stay, starting the next night for a few nights. My younger brother agreed to pick him up and bring him over, since he often came to hang out at my place on the weekends anyway. Plus, he was just as close to Corey as I was growing up, being just a year younger than me. My brother David messaged me, letting me know he had just picked up Corey, and that they were on their way. Now that was about 7pm. By 9pm I was getting concerned, as Google showed that it would be a 45 minute drive from the address Corey gave my brother to pick him up. I tried texting and calling David several times, but no response. Finally, at about 9.30, there was a knock on my door. I was relieved to see it was David and Corey. We exchanged greetings, and I could immediately smell the strong scent of alcohol on Corey's breath. David was acting strange and quiet. Not his normal, zany self, to say the least. I also noticed track marks on Corey's arms, something my dad had made me familiar with. I just tried to block it out of my mind. He was going through a tough time, I had to remind myself. We got to talking and sharing old stories. David not really participating like he normally would, and Corey, on the other hand, seemed upbeat, like he hadn't a care in the world. Not like I would imagine someone whose significant other had just cheated on. We moved from chatting to playing catchphrase, and after a couple games, Corey told David that he had to get his stuff from his car. David gave him the keys and went out the front door. David gave him the keys and he went out the front door. I leaned over to David and I whispered, Hey, what's up, man? We just robbed somebody, and I think they might be hurt. He said with his voice shaking, What? Corey asked me to stop him by a friend's place to pick up some money. When we went inside, he pulled a gun out and... 
He was interrupted by Corey coming back in through the door. Corey brought back a big plastic black bag and asked where the bathroom was. Acting like nothing was wrong, I pointed down the hall. He pulled something out of his bag and went to the bathroom. The guy didn't have his money, David continued. He hit him with the gun and made him sit on the couch. He told him if he moved that he would hurt him. And then he started putting the guy's stuff in the trash bag. And when I went to the car, he went back inside, and I think he beat the guy up. We have to call the police, Dave. Where's the gun now? I said. I don't know. I think it's in the bag. I knew I had to check. I walked to the bag and rustled through a slew of DVDs and video games and shoes and what looked like baggies filled with some type of narcotic as well as a pack of unopened syringes. But to my relief and simultaneously dread, I saw the gun. I pulled it out and quickly slid it under the couch. Not to seem suspicious and to keep my wife safe, I told her she had to leave in the car and call the police from there. When Corey came back, we told him that we'd sent her to go get some Taco Bell because we were hungry. About 20 tense minutes passed as we kept acting like there was nothing that had happened before finally hearing police sirens. When they stopped outside my house and the blue and red lights lit up the front windows, Corey realized what was happening. He darted for his bag, frantically searching through it before shouting, I got y'all. He then turned and ran out the back patio doors and hopped the fence. The police ran to our door shouting for us to get on the ground. They knew a gun was in the house. We complied, told them he'd ran out the back, and told them where the gun was. They were questioning me and my brother when we heard the questioning's officer walkie go off, saying that they had caught him. My brother had to ride in the back of an officer's car and show him where the robbery had taken place, as he didn't know the address, but knew how to get there. Corey had in fact assaulted the guy pretty bad, broke his nose and three ribs as well as chipping a couple teeth. The guy was afraid to call the police because he had warrants out for himself. Corey was charged with assault and battery, armed robbery, as well as a couple possession charges. He was sentenced to 10 years. That all took place four years ago. But last week I got an anonymous message on my Facebook that simply read, I haven't forgotten about you. This summer started off with a trip to a very prestigious university for what is basically nerd camp. Most people were actually very lovely except for a handful of rather strange, sex-starved, or just plain socially awkward individuals who made comments that would send chills down almost anyone's spine. For example, one boy made a comment about how we really shouldn't have any qualms about secretly injecting people's water supply with numerous biological chemicals as a means of testing what is suitable for biological warfare. Another brought a roll of what looked like 10,000 condoms and eagerly showed my roommate and I in a coffee shop with the biggest grin on his face. One of my three roommates also had a particular habit of waking up in the wee hours of the morning, getting dressed, hopping back to bed and then darting out the door without even a hello as soon as any of us had woken up. The only real physical issues I had were at the final dance when us biochemical kids were introduced to the engineers. I hate to bag on them, since most of my brother's friends, including his wife, are engineers. But these kids were ridiculously creepy. I was followed the whole night by one kid, who kept trying to teach me how to feel the beat in my veins, and had my wrists grabbed by other kids I met on the first day. This isn't even the worst of it. I have yet to introduce Brett. Brett was what my roommates and I described as the dictionary definition of a tall douchebag upon first impressions. He stuck out like a sore thumb amongst a sea of acne ridden teens with oversized glasses and pants that were too big for their belts. He came from money, unlike most of us, 
and liked to let everyone know how superior he was to everyone. He sat alone on all the bus rides, and until my roommate and I finally approached him, he only mingled with his fellow Pennsylvanians. He liked to brag about how long it would take him to get ready, and he probably spent more time on his hair than any girl he knew. He was ridiculously good looking, and he knew it. On one particular bus ride, the two of us managed to be stuck together when we got on late. His response was rude. Man, I don't know if I can do this. I read silently next to him as he scrolled through his Instagram pics. Glancing over, I saw him with another girl in formal attire, most likely for a dance. I saw this as an opportunity to initiate small talk and asked if he had a girlfriend. Nah, none of those are really my dates. He showed me his Facebook pictures of him with other girls in other fancy outfits. There were close to a dozen, and to be honest, I hated all of these girls. He then showed me some pictures of him at concerts, parties, and other random places, all with a different girl by his side. They're so dumb, he continued. I know they're like me, but I just hate them all. I usually take them out when I'm bored and we get hammered and hook up, but that's it. I could never date any of them. Hell, I can't even hook up when I'm sober. I was past the point of being slightly uncomfortable. The way he spoke about these girls was beyond messed up. He described several hooking ups in very intricate details and referred to the girls as though they were pieces of meat. Then the real crazy talk began. I like to take these girls out to parties and get them super drunk. I take care of them at first, help them to their bathroom, hold their hair back when they throw up. Then I like to pull them back and shove them in their vomit, kick their face in, spit on them and tell them to go kill themselves. These girls, you know, they're so dumb. If I hadn't been so shocked by the words he just said, I probably would have said something like, What's wrong with you, you disgusting piece of shit? But all I could respond with was a stare equally as emotionless as his. I think he found that intriguing, maybe a little comforting, maybe a little attractive, because the rest of his trip was spent in my presence. He would often talk to me about how I was different, how I wasn't like other girls, how I didn't give a shit just like him. He would tell me his stories about belittling and dehumanizing women, as though I admired them. To be honest, I didn't say much because I didn't even know how to respond. He was a maniac, and he really got off on treating girls like shit. We had the strangest level of friendship, because I was so disgusted with him and at the same time he was an attractive person. He was extremely charismatic and had a great sense of humour and was extremely intelligent. But there was something off about him and it was only because of what he had disclosed with me that I felt I was able to pick up on it. His eyes, piercing blue, were so empty and cold. When talking about personal topics or tragic events, he never missed a beat. With a sympathetic reply, but it was so disingenuous. I discussed the topic with my roommates and we came to the conclusion that Brett was a sociopath, a narcissistic sadist or some other type of psychopath and with no matter how attractive we should all stay away. After the camp ended I never thought I would see him again and he would simply be a creepy story to tell my friends. However that was not the case. My final trip of the summer, you better believe it, was to accompany my best friend Pamela on her annual trip to visit her dad in Pennsylvania. Somewhere in those wooded forests lurked a monster by the name of Brett. I had no intention of meeting up with him, but I did plan on meeting up with one of his friends, Drew. We had hit it off during camp, sharing many of the same interests and hobbies. He told me that before we left, if I were ever in Pennsylvania or DC, I should let him know, and he would be more than happy to meet up. Although he and Brett hung out at camp, I knew that they weren't friends back home. They were far too different. Drew was a freckly, paper-white ginger who was about 5 foot 10, and about 135 pounds at most. 
He played video games and hiked for fun. Not to mention Brett specifically told me that he hated Drew. Apparently, Brett believed Drew was trying way too hard to be like him, and this was most definitely untrue. So Drew, Pamela and I go hiking around his town. I don't ask about Brett when Drew mentions him, but my best friend is dying to meet him after everything I told her. Drew says he can invite us to a party, and then we can all catch up. We ended up going, since apparently Pamela thought spending the night making venison jerky wasn't a preferable alternative to meeting up with a crazed individual. The party ends up being something out of a nightmare. Raging college kids and a shit ton of drugs. All the stuff that would make me want to hide in a corner. Pamela was having a blast. And so far, I imagined to avoid consuming any of the drinks Brett was shoving in my hand. He was staying way too close to me the whole night, trying to pull me onto him when we sat on couches, grazing my ass whenever I stood near him, and at one point he pressed against the wall and forcibly kissed my neck, before his not-date came around and got very pissy with the both of us. I hid from him for the rest of the night. Eventually, the party began breaking up, because someone got wind that the cops were coming. Drew was rushing me to the car, but I couldn't find Pamela anywhere. I looked in the bathroom and found Pamela flipping her shit and dragging me to the tub. There in the tub was Brett State. She was surrounded by vomit and her face and lips were palish blue. The both of us began freaking out because she wasn't breathing. I called Drew and he raced into the house and the three of us dragged her out the front and called an ambulance. Drew was pretty stoned, but told us to wait in the car, and he would explain everything to the cops, since he didn't want to get us in trouble. The cops came, and questioned everyone at the scene. The girl was taken away, and Pamela ended up having to call her dad to pick us up. The next day I called Drew, and he told me the girl was alright. She had also spoken to Brett, who seemed completely unfazed by everything. Apparently... She passed out whilst they were fooling around in the basement, so we took the liberty of dumping her in the bathtub where he knew someone would find her, since she was his friend. Then he split, because he didn't want to get into any trouble for drinking underage. I know the world is a pretty messed up place, and people can be downright evil, but to witness this first hand is rather nauseating. Brett is only 18, and it terrifies me to think about what he's capable of. Imagine in a few years. So I truly hope I never have to look into your solar size again. This story takes place in August of 2013, in the mountains of South Oregon. I am a USAF Security Forces Airman, in other words, a military policeman. My girlfriend was at work, and as a swelteringly hot day began to turn into thunderstorms, my buddy Nick and I decided to go exploring some back roads and get out of the heat in town. South Oregon is crisscrossed with logging roads some actively used, and many totally forgotten and grown over. Nick and I spent many of our days searching on roads that we knew, finding roads that we did not, and driving for hours into the mountains, eventually navigating back to paved roads. On this particular day, with storm clouds building over the mountains, we set off on a road that we'd never been on before, and began the drive into the mountains. After driving for about an hour, we hadn't seen nor heard any signs of any other people in the woods. We rounded a bend into the thick fir woods and emerged into a meadow that was totally surrounded by thick aspen groves. The meadow was perfectly flat and eerily still. We both noticed the strange stillness almost immediately. No birds, 
hardly any insect noises, no squirrels, and certainly no other people. On the far side of the meadow, right at the edge of the tree line, there was a picnic table. The table was very odd, however. It was painted a bright orange and was much larger than a typical picnic table in a pub. Remarking on this, Nick drove through the meadow to get a closer look. I remember being apprehensive as we approached. The whole scenario was exceptionally strange. The overall silence of the Aspen Grove was unsettling. Also, it was nearly impossible to see far into the trees, as aspens grow extremely close together. When we parked by the table, I hopped out the passenger seat of the truck to check it out. I'm not very tall, only about five foot five, but regardless, the table was ridiculously oversized and practically unusable. The seats were nearly at chest level, meaning I would have to climb up to even sit on them. As I was looking at the table, Nick called me over to the truck, and I noticed that he was looking back into the aspens. At first, I couldn't see what he was looking at, but then I noticed a splash of colour that was completely out of place in the thick trees. A small, one-man tent was set back in the trees, about 50 feet away from this strange table. I had an initial feeling of dread hit me and felt certain that there was someone in that tent and if we could see the tent they could undoubtedly see us. There were no campgrounds in the area, no people, no main roads for miles. Surely someone camping so remote would be, well at the very least, a strange person. However, as we observed the tent, we didn't see any movement, nor hear any strange sounds coming from it. Nick suggested that I call out. I didn't want to, but I did. Hey, anyone in there? There was no reply. Feeling completely on edge, Nick and I thought about driving away and leaving this strange area but we began to fear the worst. What if there was a body in that tent? What if somebody had gotten kidnapped? Foolish, I know, but we thought it just the same. After some debate, we decided to have Nick turn the truck around to drive away from the campsite, should there be any need to leave in a hurry. He would be waiting at the wheel, my heart pounding. I started walking through the trees towards the tent. I was totally keyed up, with my senses on full alert. When I reached the campsite, several things struck me as odd. Backpacks were scattered all over. No fire had been built, and no wood collected. The tent, oh the tent. It was literally full of backpacks and women's clothing. Full of dread, I turned to leave to tell Nick what I had seen. As soon as I left, I heard Nick begin to yell. Let's go, let's get out of here! Not knowing what he was yelling about, I ran back to the truck. When I broke out of the trees, I saw a beat-up old Ford Tauros on the road, blocking us from leaving the meadow. I immediately leapt into the passenger seat and Nick floored the gas pedal. The car was occupied by two men and the third person was laying against the window of the back seat. As we drove across the meadow, the driver attempted to block us from the road, but Nick drove around them and accelerated the way that we'd come from. I looked back and saw the car attempting to turn around on the narrow road. Nick drove like a madman, and though I was honestly terrified that they would catch up, we hit the highway without seeing the car again. I still don't know if the person in the back was male or female. 
I called the state police and they promised to send a trooper out to check the scene. I received a call the next day from the trooper, stating that the campsite and the backpacks and all the women's clothing was gone though he could tell that people had been in the area. The strange table was still by the thick aspen grove, and I have not returned to the area, and do not have any intention of doing so again. Every summer since I was four, my nana took me and my sisters to California. I always loved going, since she had a pool and let me drive around on her golf cart. I blamed teenage angst, since I was turning 15 that summer. But I threw a huge fit to my mum over going. I had just gotten a boyfriend and didn't want to go long distance for a month and all three of my younger sisters were going to tag along, meaning that I had to babysit. Mum put her foot down, told me to suck it up, so obviously I was going to be a pretty pissy teen the whole time. So in the beginning of June, we loaded up in Nana and Papa's van and headed off. I live on a small coastal town in Oregon, so the trip was going to take around two days to get all the way down to Palm Springs. Looking back on it, I was totally miserable to be around. Picking on my sisters, ignoring my grandparents, huffing and puffing the entire time. So, I really didn't blame them for what they did. A day had passed since we finally made it to the rental home. When my mum called all of a sudden, excitedly, telling me that since I was older, I was getting a chance to travel, that is fully paid for, and that I should be grateful. I interrupted her saying, we go to Cali every year, so why is she so stoked about this trip? No, kiddo, your Aunt Pat is flying you out to stay with her for the next two months. She's paying for all of it. Isn't that so nice? I was so confused and just stood there listening to her ramble on about the trip. And then I got pissy. What do you mean two months? Doesn't she live in Texas? Why am I going to Texas? I was livid. Well, turns out that Papa had grown pretty tired of my teenage moods pretty fast. And rightfully so and complained about it to his sister, Aunt Pat. She told him to send me to her, and it would be a good experience for me. All expenses paid. Nana and Papa didn't seem to have an issue with it, and neither did my mum. I, on the other hand, saw plenty. My first thoughts were of my boyfriend back home, naturally. And being bored and alone in Texas wasn't looking like a fun option either. I begged and begged my mum to let me stay in Cali, but she insisted that I had to go on a learning experience. So the next two days I was completely sullen, until I was dropped off at the airport. It wasn't until I was actually boarding that I realised I hadn't seen my Aunt Pat or her husband Rick since the age of seven. The only form of communication I had with them was the annual Christmas card with the attached $10. To be honest, I didn't even remember what they looked like. I tried texting my mum at a last-ditch effort to get out of it. But nope, the plane ticket was paid for, and I was already boarded. She argued back that I was exaggerating, that... It was my papa's sister, so I would be fine, and to quit complaining or she'd cut my phone off completely as punishment. So I strapped up and flew to Texas. I didn't get to the airport until late, and was worried that they had forgotten about me. I get to the waiting area, and even though we were the only people there, 
save for one old Latino man. They were waiting with a sign plastered with my name on it. I gave a meek smile and a wave, and they ran up excitedly, asking about my flight and what not. They were an older couple, older than I thought they were, with matching grey hair and oddly tall. They were both dressed like tourists, with a Hawaiian dress shirt and khakis, and Rick had shades on with a safari hat, even though we were inside. I figured that they were just weird old people and brushed it off. We arrived back at their house, a really nice one, in a rich senior living area. Aunt Pat showed me around the house and led me to the spare room which I would occupy and left me be. I instantly called my boyfriend, let him know that I landed safely and told him about the flight and how weird my relatives were. Since I was off on my sleeping schedule, I ended up sleeping until noon the next day. I groggily rolled out of bed and walked downstairs to grab some breakfast, and I was met with a note on the fridge, explaining that they were both at the store and would be back soon. I ate, got dressed, and waited. They pulled up shortly after, and whisked into the house with a huge bag. Auntie Pat handed me the sack and grinned. We got you a little present. We're both just so excited you're here. I opened it up to reveal a hideous star-spangled banner dress and an accompanying hairpiece. It was so horrendous, but as rude of a teen as I was, I wasn't point-blank disrespectful. I gave them both a huge smile and thanks. Rick pulled out the dress and let it unfold in all its glory. We walk in the summer parade every year and we want you to walk with us. Our roundabout is the flag theme this year. Why don't you go and try it on? Make sure it fits. Weirdly it fit just fine, much to their delight. The parade was in three days and until then we would do sightseeing around Texas. For those three days, I was completely ill-tempered. Everything they were doing was making me want to scream. I was so annoyed and irritable. They drone on about one thing, argue off tangents about another, that my teenage body did not want to keep up with. Waking up very early to go on snail pace walks, quick to bed at night, with no TV. Just basic old people lifestyle. But to a teen, it was hell. All of the tourist spots they took me to were very bland, and I was not in the mood to be appreciative. Whether they were starting to get annoyed with me or not, they never showed it. I wouldn't have cared if they were anyway. I figured they just send me home early if I did get on the nerves enough with my moodiness. So the big day comes around, and I'm garbled up in my outfit ready to die of humiliation. The parade was pretty long, walking about three miles through the neighbourhood. I half waved and fake smiled the entire way through, then followed the giant barbecue, which went on until late at night. Aunt Pat told me to stick close to them and not to wander off since I'd get lost pretty quickly. After about an hour of being glued to them, they started to keep less of an eye on me and focused on their friends. I walked off to get some food and decided to keep walking. It was a nice night out and felt good to get some fresh air and freedom. I watched some kids play with sparklers Adults laughing loudly and spilling their beers, and started to feel a bit better. I kept strolling on, having a good time people watching. When I saw two little girls sprint across the street a couple of blocks down from me, waving sparklers, I grinned, thinking about my own little sisters, when I noticed a weird shadow just beyond where the kids had ran. My smile dropped and I froze, peering harder to make out what it was. 
Then the shadow moved quickly, following where the girls did. I figured it was probably just one of their parents, but the hair standing on the back of my neck said otherwise. But I decided there wasn't any harm in following, just to make sure my subconscious was wrong, and I jogged down the street. I made it to where I saw the girls run by, and looked down the road to check if I could see them. There was a little play structure at the end of the street for the neighborhood kids to play on, and I guessed they probably ran down there to play. I made it to the park and heard giggles coming from the tube slide and a small pile of burnt out sparklers on the ground below the entrance. I glanced around and didn't see anyone creeping. In fact, I didn't even see a parent nearby. Knowing if my sisters did this, my mother would be livid. It was dark, and no one was around for at least five blocks before the party, and it was getting cold and late. I made my presence known to not scare the kids, and pretended to get a phone call so they could hear my voice and know I was a girl, hopefully someone they felt they could trust. Oh hey, yeah, I'm down at the little park waiting for you. See you soon. The giggle stopped, and the little faces peered out. They couldn't have been more than four or five years old. I waved hello to them, and asked them if they were having fun. They nodded, and clambered out. I know how to talk to little kids, since I've been around so many of them for such a long time, and they warmed up to me pretty fast. While playing with them for a little bit, I asked them where their parents were, and if they knew where they lived, they ignored me and continued to drag me around to play games. I really like your dress. It looks like mine. My grandma got it for me. One of them did a quick spin for me to show off her bedazzled flag dress. I remembered then that all the cul-de-sacs were themed and figured that they had to live in one of the houses around Aunt Pat's. I asked if they walked to the parade and they nodded, and went off telling me about how fun it was riding the float. They had a big flag float in our section, so they must have been up on it, and I didn't see them since I spent most of my time zoned out. As I was playing Super Sleuth, I saw a shadow move from down the street towards the park. I got the heebie-jeebies again, and kept my eye on it. The girls had crawled back into the slide during this time and were trying to get me to catch them. Something came over me and I told them to keep quiet for just a little bit, that we were going to play a joke on someone. They loved the idea, thank God, and cut their hands to their mouths with big grins. By the time the shadow figure was within the lamppost that illuminated the park, I could see him clearly. He looked like a normal guy, middle-aged, just slightly dishevelled. The closer he got to me, though, the worse I felt. I was sitting on the swing, acting like I was texting when he came up to me. Have you seen my girls anywhere? I lost them up at the parade. He peered around the playground quickly. I hoped they'd come here to play. He trailed off and gave me a nervous laugh. His story seemed to add up. But then again, the girls only mentioned Grandma. Oh no, I haven't. But I could keep an eye out for them. What are their names? This was the true test, since the girls had already told me their names during me quizzing them. Uh, um, Emma and Ava. Two little girls? Blonde? Haven't seen them? Wrong. Their names weren't even close to what he just bullshitted with. My creep I meter shot up. I shook my head, no, and apologised, and went back to my phone. Since Aunt Pat was tech illiterate, she doesn't text, which left me stuck waiting on this dude to leave, so that I could call her and explain what was happening. Instead, he decides to pop a squat down on the swing next to me. Great. He starts to make small talk with me, asking where I lived around here, what my name was, and if I had a boyfriend. 
I keep my answers short, making up a fake name, saying my dad was coming to get me soon, and his questions then started to get more personal. If I was on my period, how old I was, if I was a virgin. I snapped at him and asked him why he was bothering me, and that he should be out looking for his kids. That's when I saw the knife. He shifted in the swing and his shirt went up, revealing a huge knife clipped to his pocket. I tried acting like I didn't see it, as I pulled out my phone to text my boyfriend to call 911. The guy snatched my cell and kept asking for my passcode, wanting to see if I had nudes on my phone. I was scared to piss him off. I'm worried if I started yelling it would scare the girls into making noise. I started acting like I was into him, keeping him calm, hopefully get him away from the kids long enough for me to help in some fashion. I laughed and said I didn't have nudes, but he insisted on getting my passcode. I claimed it was some random four digit number and it locked him out of my phone. He tossed it back to me and said the phone was busted. He then got up and asked me to come and help him look for his girls, that it would be much faster to search if I did. He pointed off down the street he'd come from and insisted they must have gone that way. I stood up slowly, trying to stall and figuring out what to do, but he slipped an arm around my waist and herded me off. Maybe I should go the opposite way, cover more ground. I tried to peel away from him, but his grip was tight. No, they went this way. No use splitting up. He kept coming up with excuses to keep me there, and I was terrified of what would happen if he got mad so I stayed quiet. His hand kept travelling down my ass and groping it, and it took every ounce of me not to break into sobs right there. I felt so stupid. What was my plan? I left the girls alone. I'm alone with a crazy person, and no one knows where either of us are. Then I heard the sweet sound of sandals slapping on pavement, and a booming voice yell out, What do you think you're doing? Uncle Rick had come to save the day. He was running down the sidewalk towards me, as fast as 75-year-old Rick can go, which apparently was pretty fast. The guy suddenly let go of me and whipped out his knife, aiming at Rick. I ran away and started yelling to my uncle that he had a knife. Apparently, my aunt and uncle both have concealed weapon permits, and why wouldn't they? It's Texas. He whipped out his gun and started yelling at me to get back. The man's eyes grew wide as he throws the knife in Rick's direction and turns to run and hop to fence and keeps on running through someone's yard and kept going. Rick lowered his gun and ushered me to him and I started choking out what happened between sobs. He kept his cool the entire time and wrapped me in a big bear hug. We went back to the park and I crawled inside the tube and find the little girls curled up at the bottom together asleep. Rick called on Pat and I woke up the kids, congratulating them on staying so well and quiet. We all climbed out of there when Aunt Pat showed up in her car. I got a good lecture from her and so did the girls. Apparently, Aunt Pat knew them and their grandma, and loaded us up and took us back to the barbecue, which was now shut down and replaced with a search party and police. The girls ran back to their grandma, and I had to explain what happened to the police and gave a description of the guy. Turned out, they had multiple calls on him for hovering around the playground and following kids home from the bus stop. They were surprised when I said Rick hadn't shot the guy, just scared him. And the cops turned to my uncle and asked why he didn't. And Rick gestures to me. She's from Oregon. Didn't want to make her liberal ass shit itself. The next day, Aunt Pat woke me up early and drove me to a gym, where she then paid for a trainer to give me self-defense lessons for the rest of the time I was in Texas. After the incident, I was much less of a dickhead teen and did a 180 on my mood. Aunt Pat didn't even call to tell my mum, saying there was no point of worrying her if we handled it. I don't know if they ever caught the creep, but I definitely have the skill set now to handle him 
if I ever run into him or someone like him again. I just hope I never do.